Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are sitting down with Jesse Powell of Kraken, the exchange based in uh, California, who just recently went, as Forbes called it, on a hiring spree, which is somewhat of an anomaly during the coronavirus. So I wanted to sit down and speak with Jesse about what's going on at Kraken. So thank you for joining us, Jesse. Thanks for having me. So could you kind of elaborate on uh, basically uh, Kraken hiring despite the economic downturn and, and why that is and if it in your opinion, is reflective of blockchain or cryptocurrency trades in that industry? Yeah, so I think the whole industry has seen an uptick in activity in the last uh, two months or so as the traditional markets have gone totally haywire. Um, you know, the economic outlook is very uncertain. Um, flows of physical cash are, um, are being stopped through, you know, all of the... Um, shutdown of, of work around the world um, and, and people are turning to cryptocurrency Bitcoin specifically as something uh, that looks like relatively speaking a more stable store of value uh, something that's predictable and known in a very uncertain time and something that is transferable across borders globally digitally uh, without any intermediary or any need for someone to physically haul around cash I noticed somewhat of like this initial shock period when uh, the lockdown started in, in the U.S. in particular that there, the industry did kind of like come to a standstill in some ways, um, especially the mm -hmm. night when uh, President Trump announced that you couldn't fly in from Europe anymore and all the markets crashed. I think there was like a general mm -hmm. just shock in days almost. And yeah. then quickly, uh, my experience, like shortly after that, like things really kind of picked up and left off picked up right where they left off, if not even a little more um, kind of uh, busy. Did you experience right. something similar? Yeah, we saw exactly that. And there's been some blockchain analysis on this to try to track kind of the flows of coins. And uh, what we saw was basically uh, recent buyers selling and um, the long-term holders continuing to hold or buy more. And uh, so we think what happened was basically uh, – kind of a reaction to what was happening in, in the markets was people uh, just going to cash for safety, um, you know, not knowing what to expect, just wanting to have certainty with cash. Uh, also maybe not knowing, you know, if their bank account was going to be shut down at some point. Uh, so getting cash was important. They also have, have had to cover uh, margin positions in the traditional market. So they maybe needed to sell their Bitcoin to, to cover losses in other places. But, um, you know, since that, yeah, the, the market has rebounded substantially uh, and growth has been huge. We've, we've seen, you know, 2x sign up numbers over the last several weeks, um, which is in part why we're hiring so many more people now. We are like a mid, in the midst of the great lockdown, as the IMF termed it. So I'm curious, uh, what do you think the effects on the crypto market, crypto jobs market of the great lockdowns, and then also what IMF is calling the biggest uh, economic recession, probably a depression since the Great Depression? I think more and more people are going to get interested in Bitcoin, you know, re researching it, trading it, uh, spending it are all things you can do online. Um, if you don't have a credit card right now, you're in a pretty bad spot if you need to order something to be delivered to you. And there are a lot of services out there that actually let you buy things you know, off of Amazon, for example, um, with Bitcoin. You know, I've seen guys lined up at an ATM, Bitcoin ATM, before I asked them, what are you guys doing here? And they said, well, we've got to buy Bitcoin because with our cash, because we don't have credit, we can't get a credit card and we have no other way to engage with uh, the digital world financially. So, I think you'll see more people turn to Bitcoin, both out of necessity and just out of interest, uh, having finally taken the time to research it now that there's a problem really at their door and the traditional system seems to be completely breaking down all over the world. Uh, so increased uh, customer demand is going to mean increased business for us and it's going to mean increased hiring. And, um, you know, we've just hired uh, 100 people in the last couple of weeks. Um, specifically from the company's own uh, members of existing employees, households, and close family, uh, all into support-related roles. Uh, so we did a super streamlined onboarding, um, super quick. 
excuse me, super quick yeah, that's um, uh, onboarding for these guys um, to get them on. And, you know, in, in part, that's just part of taking care of our, of our people. Um, and, you know, on the other side of that is, is great. We get to, we get to meet this um, immediate demand. Could you elaborate on hiring uh, like uh, close family members and roommates of uh, people who are, were already on your team? I think that's unique. Yeah, that was something we decided to do because, well, for two reasons. One, uh, we felt like members of the household were more likely to, um, to be able to vouch you know, for each other. Uh, two, they were in a remote working environment, having somebody there with you to help onboard you is really useful you know, just someone sitting next to you to help to answer questions for you. Uh, so there's some advantages there just logistically. Uh, and then taking care of people's households, you know, it's, it's definitely not in our interest as an employer to have our employees completely distracted with the disaster that's happening, um, you know, with, with a spouse losing their job or a roommate losing their job. And you guys have got to now figure out, you know, how, how are you going to buy food or how are you going to, um, pay your rent. Uh, so, you know, for us, it, it was able, we were able to alleviate that pressure, which, which we think just makes people more productive in general. You know, they're not going to have those distractions. Um, they're going to be happy that they're working. They're going to be grateful for the job. Uh, so we think just culturally um, and business-wise, it just made sense on so many levels to, to try to target uh, the people in the households who, uh, of our employees who are affected. I'm looking at this as Bitcoin was released in 2009. That's when the software was released. Um, and in that Genesis block, there is, of course, a Chancellor on brink of second bailouts. So we're looking at the first similar situation since the 2008-2009 crisis. Of course, then there was mm -hmm. a credit default crisis in 2011. And um, I think there, we're looking at Bitcoin in particular as a potential safe haven from the rest of the financial industry. Is that how you're mm -hmm. looking at it? And is that what is sort of informing the way you're going to be moving forward throughout the rest of 2020? Well, I look at Bitcoin as, as a safe haven in terms of store of value. And, it, and it's a, a financial rail of last resort uh, when the existing system fails, you know, when cash fails, or when, when centralized banking fails. Uh, in terms of whether, um, you know, Bitcoin is is kind of going to going to take over the world of of um, payments or of finance? You know, I still think we're a long way off from that, but I do think that this situation is kind of forcing more people to take a look at Bitcoin. There's lots and lots of talks about Bitcoin potentially being like almost a world reserve currency scenario, which I think is like really crazy and also a really loaded notion as well. There's so much like uh, to unpack with mm -hmm. such a concept but um it is interesting seeing it be floated i've i've seen texts that go pretty in depth about like the need for a super super national currency or whatever like the imf mm -hmm. has tried to uh issue these sorts of things and i'm seeing all sorts of like notions about how like if not bitcoin for whatever reason perhaps libra perhaps the uh, chinese uh um central bank digital currency uh, mm -hmm. really interesting kind of discussions unfolding. And also I think a lot of discussions that, um, that have a lot of implications that we have yet to hit up against. Um, I'm kind of curious, could you um, discuss uh, what is surprising novel ironic about hiring and blockchain in general? Uh, I think, you know, that you're hiring the, the roommates and family members of team members is really interesting. Uh, were you planning on um, perhaps needing to hire in 2020 perhaps because of the having in the first place or was the crisis something that really brought this on? Yeah, we, we forecasted hiring about 250 people this year, but we added another hundred on top of that. So we, we've still got another 150 or so open roles. You can check on our jobs board. Actually, there, there are a lot of unlisted roles um, that are open as well. Uh, so this was basically ahead of schedule. Uh, we weren't expecting coronavirus to drop and all of this uncertainty. We were kind of expecting, um, some more activity to come closer to or, or lagging behind the having. You know, historically, it's been maybe about like six months after the having that we really see you know, things start to pick up. Um, so that was kind of our plan was more of like the second half of the year 
to, to hire more in the support functions to handle uh, the additional um, user growth. Um, so it was definitely a surprise to us, but you know, it was one more reason to, um, the coronavirus thing was, was reason to, uh, to hire earlier than you know, we normally were, were predicting we would need to, and more in total. I've seen similar data about the act, the activity in the industry really picking up in the months after the halving. And, you know, off the top of my head, you, I can see us seeing a similar scenario play out here despite the great disruption that we've seen in 2020. I think that the shock of the $6 trillion to $8 trillion bailouts will have been in the past by the halving. And I think a lot of people will probably have moved on with their with their daily lives in so far as they are able to, uh, kind of as we return to normal, or what some are calling the quote new normal. And I hope um, so. yeah, we can see. I think uh, unless there are so, at least if we have like kind of like a, a a slow return to normal life without like increasing lockdowns or like a, a second phase of lockdowns, or if um, there isn't another stock crash uh, which might be precipitated by uh, um, martial law scenarios then I could see that the Bitcoin having would play out similar to the past Bitcoin havings I'm curious could mm-hmm. you kind of discuss being in a remote uh, work environment now and how that transition has gone yeah so I mean we've we've been a remote first company since the start um, we only had maybe about a hundred people working in offices around the world um, when coronavirus hit and we since um, shut down those offices. I mean, not permanently, they're, they're paused. Everyone's working from home now. So it, you know, we've got 800 people in the, in the whole company. Um, those 100 people now are also just working from home along with everyone else. So it hasn't been much of an adjustment at all for us. Um, you know, if anything, it's great to have everyone on the same level now, you know, without the office clicks uh, and, you know, the, the people that are not in the office. Um, so it's, it's been good for us. I mean, we were fully prepared for this, right? We've been doing this. Uh, actually, I've been doing this since 2001. My last business was also fully remote um, and the tools has just gotten so much better since then. So um, it's been great. Uh, you know, if you have the tools, if you have the process in place, if you kind of know what the pitfalls are, you know how to help people get set up to work in their homes. Um, it can be fantastic. And there are tons of resources out there now. Lots of companies are putting out their own guides on how they, they got it working. So I think something more companies should take a look at. It's probably something more companies will stick to even after um, the, the threat of coronavirus passes and it should be something you always have in your back pocket as a as a go-to in case you need to take your company remote you know and get everyone out of the office again i have many peers who have not worked from home before and they are very very happy right now with not having to go into the office etc do you have any advice for people who are transitioning from um office life to working from home yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff. I mean, you know, it's it's not always great for everyone. Um, some people are very extroverted and really thrive um, in a social environment, and you know, just not not being able to physically interact with people uh, can be really depressing. We've actually had some people in the past. We do a better job of screening for this now, and you know, warning people up front, and we give better, you know, people better uh, tools to cope. And all this, but um, we've had several people in the past just say, after six months, you know, this is not for me. I'm never going to work in another remote company again. I just have to be around people, um, you know, and that's totally fine. Um, but you know, some some tips for people getting started. I think having a really great workstation is super important. You know, you don't want to be hunched over all day. Um, you know, working at a, a terrible desk in a terrible chair, uh, and a lot of people just don't um they're not set up that way because they haven't expected to to spend a lot of time at home so i would guess that kind of the ergonomic situation is going to be one of the first things that that really um kind of starts to hurt people who were surprised to be working at home um other things you want to do 
you know, it's tough in this situation, but to the extent you can just get out of the house from time to time, go take a walk. If your gym is closed, you know, try to do some calisthenics or something in your garage uh, or, you know, whatever you've got. Um, try to get involved in the social chat rooms um, in the company. You know, we've got, I don't know, there must be more than like a hundred different uh, social rooms, which are, you know, basically subject specific water coolers where, you know, people hang out and chat and they share photos of their dogs. Um, they share tips for cooking. They share the latest news in their region about um, whatever virus updates. Uh, so that kind of thing can really give you back that sense of community. Maybe if you're coming from an office where, you know, you used to just casually interact with people um, so that your work is not just all, um, you know, by yourself um, without any social component. Uh, those are some good things. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I'm sure there's a laundry list of things out there. Um, I've been doing it for so long. I've probably forgotten all the, all the great things that I just do like automatically now. Yeah, some things that I like to do is like I try to keep a to a small to do list about the daily activities that I got to get to from most important to least important. So at least like at the start of the day, I, I can get the most important things done, which kind of takes some of the pressure off. Or um, yeah. getting out for a walk, like you said, is extremely important. I try to take business calls on a walk, so I'll try to line things up. Like I had a phone call the other day that lasted probably about an hour, and I was able to line that up with a walk outside. Took the dog out. Um, awesome. one, cha one, one challenge that I'm going to, uh, kind of, uh, try to overcome moving forward is like you said, all of these tools they've really developed in, in the last 10 years over the last 20 years, I'm going to try to challenge myself to now value, uh, privacy in the remote work environment more and see mm -hmm. how much privacy can I kind of, um, take back while maintaining the efficiency of so many of these cloud-based apps. And um, mm -hmm. I, haven't, I have not uh, started down that path, but that's one challenge that I'm giving myself kind of moving forward because like all of the tools that we're using, like um, what comes to mind is the Google Suite. Like I, I use Google Suite for business. So mm -hmm. I've got like a Google Calendar, Google Docs, Google Drive, mm -hmm. et cetera. And all these things are cloud-based. So like a challenge would be, would, for me would be like, how can I then maybe... Uh, not use docs, use a, a more private word processor and still collaborate with others. Uh, how can I uh, really kind of um, seek out alternatives to the cloud, which uh, I, it, it, the, the ease with which we're able to collaborate on the cloud is probably unbeatable at this point, but yeah. we do, especially like sensitive organizations hand over a lot of, um, a lot of data that, perhaps it's not as secure as we'd like to believe it is. Mm -hmm. For sure. This is really tough as an individual. Um, in some ways it's easier. In some ways it's harder. There are a lot of apps that you use in a large business setting have enterprise versions, which you can host yourself. You can put behind your VPN um, where you can you know, set up custom encryption. But um, you know, G Suite, for example, there is no self-hosted version of that no on-premise version, you're, you're using Google's cloud or you're not using it at all. Uh, and it is extremely convenient, right? Uh, so you've definitely got to kind of weigh the pros and cons of that. Like what kind of stuff are you putting in there? You know, you've got to assume, okay, there's some admin at Google that maybe could potentially read this stuff. Um, you know, you kind of mitigate the risk just by, using it for its convenience but making sure that on the very sensitive stuff you're just not putting it in there you're, you're using another channel to transmit that information or store that information um if you need to collaborate on very sensitive information i think that's like where, where it gets really tough um there are not many tools to do that like as an individual where you know you you wouldn't want to just spin up a fully uh, an enterprise version of um Confluence or, you know, the Atlassian suite just for you and like two other guys or something. Um, but there's some other tools. I mean, Keybase is like a really good chat tool that has file secure uh, encrypted file sharing. Um, 
lot of people are using Signal for chat. Uh, Wicker is another chat tool that's fully encrypted. Um, so there's some some great communications tools as far as like collaborating on documents in real time. That's super tough. Um, it's gonna be old school. Like you got to be old school. You got to like save it and then send it as a file, and then that person's got to edit. Man, that's like yeah, crazy because I mean, the way that's the way it was back in the day. For sure, and that's we still do that for a lot of stuff uh, where we will send. You know, we encrypt the file. Um, you know, all of the company's internal communications are are encrypted. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, do it on Microsoft Word uh, on your desktop, encrypt the attachment or encrypt the whole email and, yeah, go back and forth that way. It's not real time. But, you know, again, depending on how sensitive the document you're working with is or the information, um, that's just what you got to do. I, I anticipate cloud to really be the story of 2020 to 2030. I think everything's going to the cloud and that like I was doing a report on like investing for the new normal or whatever. And it's really mm -hmm. kind of like uh, cl the cloud was one of the uh, main growth industries that I foresaw. So uh, just kind of sure. a, in conclusion, I'm curious, uh, what advice do you have for people who are looking to, uh, to um, basically move into the uh, Bitcoin industry? Well, there's tons of Bitcoin job boards out there. Uh, Kraken is hiring, you know, for a ton of roles. You can come check out our jobs board at, uh, at kraken.com. Um, I would say if you don't have any experience in the industry, that is one thing to get yourself up to speed on. Just start reading as much as you can. Um, you know, we often will ask people questions in the interview process, just general crypto questions, you know, to, to see if they have just even a basic understanding uh, or they're even at all interested in the industry you know we, we prefer to hire people who have some real interest in in crypto and uh, not just someone looking for any random job so i would say study up a little bit um, if you're applying for a job at a, at a specific business use their service try it out have an opinion about it um, you know it never hurts to come into an interview with a feature request or um, a, a constructive critique uh, you know let the let them know that you know you're familiar with their business and you didn't just blast out uh you know a thousand applications indiscriminately um you know i don't know this is this is something else that goes back to the online world but i i look at applying for jobs a lot like online dating and i think you know if you think about like how are you going to get the person to respond to your message in an inbox with like a thousand other messages um you know i think you've got to just go a little bit further to um, to let them know that you really like took some time to understand uh, this, them and why this might be a good fit. Uh, I think a lot of people just kind of indiscriminately apply for jobs, just hoping to get something as if it's a numbers game. But um, you know, I think there is actually a lot of stuff you can do to if you're if you can be more targeted um, to get that attention from the recruiter or the screener, whoever's um, reviewing the stack of. A thousand applications for one role. I'd say Bitcoin job boards are a great place. They're, they're on Reddit. Um, you can just search Bitcoin jobs. Um, there's, I mean, there's got to be a thousand Bitcoin crypto job roles open right now, at least. Also, I think volume is important. I know people will apply for like one job and they'll feel accomplished, but like the way I kind of have learned to go about this is that like volume also is your friend. Um, mm -hmm. and any breaking news at Kraken that people should know about? Nothing super duper exciting, um, right away. Uh, we've got some, some other, you know, we're, we're basically working through, uh, a lot of feature requests right now. So, um, I probably start to see more stuff, more stuff like that, like rather than, uh, mind blowing new releases, um, just a lot of kind of things people have been asking for for a long time coming up um, in the service. Um, so we're excited about that. I mean, that means less, less support tickets and um, uh, more happy clients. Um, you know, I did want to get to one thing that you said earlier uh, real quick, which was uh, when we were talking about the uh, global reserve currency, possibly, uh, you know, we're talking about Bitcoin versus um, Fed coin versus China coin versus Libra. 
you know, Bitcoin is the only one of those things which is decentralized and fully predictable, you know, programmatically, mathematically predictable. And I think that really sets it apart from any other kind of centrally managed or, you know, a national cryptocurrency. And, you know, that's important because the predictability factor, I think, is what people are really looking for in a store of value. They want to know that it's going to have this supply in the future. It's going to behave this way. Um, they want to know that it's not possible for whoever issued this coin to just double the supply of it, thereby diluting everyone's holdings by 50%, which is kind of what you're seeing now. Um, and I think it's such a currency would be very competitive versus national currencies uh, because um, it's so it's so predictable. Why would you hold a national currency, which is completely unpredictable, when you could hold this thing that's very certain? Um, but to your point about each country having their own currency, you know, I think I think Italy is is an example of why you don't want to use someone else's currency. Um, you know, I think they're going to be in really bad shape coming out of this. They can't print more money because they're on the euro. And so, what do they do? Um, you know, that's, they're going to be in a tough spot. I think the U.S., you know, they're, we're printing tons of money here in the U.S. That affects everyone holding the dollar. Every dollar is going to be worth a little bit less or a lot less. We'll see how this plays out. Um, but at least it's a tool you have as a country controlling your own currency to dilute all the holders of your currency and, and redistribute, um, you know, kind of reshape the pie. But, um, you know, ideally that never happens. And, and if that cannot happen, uh, countries will be forced to plan ahead. There will be no such thing as a, as a money printing bailout. You'll just have to keep money in the bank. You'll have to save. You will have to plan for disaster scenarios. You'll have to, you know, buy all your masks in advance, all your ventilators in advance. Um, you'll have to buy insurance on unemployment. Uh, I think it'll make for a much more responsible uh, society and uh, it'll force us to invest in, in the long term rather than just looking at like the next quarter or the next day uh, about what we're going to do with our money. Um, it'll really, to, to have hard money will really force us to, to plan. And I think that's been missing around the world for a long time. You mentioned Italy. The north of Italy is where 50% of Italy's GDP is, is, comes from or is produced. So... Mm -hmm. That's a situation that could also have some cascading effects, not only for Italy, but the whole of the European Union. Right. So thank you so much, Jesse, for sitting down with me today. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, we spoke with Jesse Powell of Kraken.com, uh, one of the leading exchanges, one of the oldest exchanges, and also uh, an exchange that is based in the United States, which I think uh, I speak with a lot of people, and they, they are new to the space, and they're talking about this new exchange that they're using based in, like, Russia or, or in Hong Kong, et cetera. And, I mean, nothing against um, Russia or Hong Kong, but if you're a user in the United States, then – all of a sudden, you you are really kind of uh, taking on added risk when you're not sort of uh, mm -hmm. changes that are in the the country of your location, especially one that is so heavily regulated regulated like the United States. So thank you so much for sitting Absolutely. down with us today, and uh, we appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me.